passing over of the pen. Apparently it means, means something. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, the message this morning is from John Mark, the Apostle, a um, friend of uh, Peter's, uh, probably written between the 50s and 60s AD in Rome, where he was with Peter. Um, this is Mark 8, 31 to 38. It's the first of three predictions of Jesus' death. Um, it's a bit of a shift from Galilee for Mark, uh, because uh, if you recall, he, he was reporting all of uh, uh, Jesus' uh, public, um, um, public ministry, which was all around Galilee. And now uh, he's moved to uh, Jerusalem and, uh, and the closing days of Jesus' life. So Mark 8, reading from verse 38, Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The way of the cross. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of this, and my words in, the, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. And this is the word of the Lord. In my humble estimation, there are few harder hitting interactions with Jesus than this little story. Jesus, it seems, can see very clearly the path laid out before him, and he doesn't want his disciples to be caught unaware. And so he states it plainly, and that's not an easy moment for the disciples. When we see the imperative expressed in Scripture, this must happen, we generally think it has to do with the will of God. Jesus used the imperative here. He says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected. And often we will read it that that is an expression of the will of God. But there is another way of reading it, and that is as a prediction of inevitability. I mean, I could say to you, here we go, if I drop this packet of tissues, it must fall towards the earth. How do I know that? Many years of experience of dropping things. Now, I don't even need to be a, physici a, a physics professor and understand how mass works and gravity and all that sort of stuff. I just know because I've seen it again and again and again, and every time it happens. There's a pattern. And I think it's possible to read here in a similar way, Jesus knows he must suffer, suffer, and he doesn't need to be a professor of sociology to work out that if you don't fit into the dominant culture, that culture will react to you. You only have to have survived the school playground, in fact, to have a keen sense of how brutal people can be when they reject someone. And Jesus is not going to play along with the dominant culture, so he knows that he is at risk. He has a clear sense of call. He's going to do what his Father in heaven has called him to do. Now, if he wanted to, Jesus could have taken many opportunities to kind of diverge from that or to soften it. 
in the temple when he was 12 years old. Rather than engaging with the rabbis, Jesus could have been like most other 12-year-olds and sat quietly, maybe passively, uh, simply listened, maybe made a few nice comments and disagreed secretly in his own heart. Would have been fair enough, right? When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness at the start of his ministry, surely he could have chosen to turn the stones into bread. He was hungry. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. Jesus could have done his Sabbath healing in private. Why make such a big show of it? Or wait till the sun goes down and do it then. The people would still be healed. When the Pharisees challenged Jesus and his disciples for not following the religious traditions, Jesus didn't have to inflame the situation, did he? Calling them hypocrites and saying they neglected the commandments of God. In short, with a little bit more effort, Jesus could have fitted in a lot better, right? But that was precisely the thing he did not want to do. We may be willing to soft-pedal our convictions at times because standing our ground might risk rejection. It could be that our dominant conviction actually proves to be getting along with the most powerful, whether that is the majority or a particular power broker in a particular situation. And to be fair, that is a sensible worldly priority. You get a lot further in this world if you prioritise getting a lot further in this world. We see it in the wisdom of the world, whether it's advice about investing your money or how to engage social politics. The wisdom is generally about how you get ahead of everyone else, and that is the world's way. By contrast, Jesus is steadfast in his commitment to the kingdom. He knows the destructive undercurrent of the culture of this world, and Jesus knows the oppressive nature of fear. And he wants to set the whole world free from these things, once and for all, as we heard last week, if you were listening. And he knows it will take everything to do so. As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a movie I saw when I was about 10 years old, so before some of you were born. Uh, it's a, the original version of the Poseidon Adventure. Did anyone see the original of the Poseidon Adventure? I knew you'd see it. <laughs> James, yep, few. thank you. It was a blockbuster. Had uh, a very ju- young Gene Hackman in it, and most of you probably don't even know who that is anymore. But um, if you remember the story, there's a huge cruise liner, massive tsunami tidal wave, knocks it over, it rolls over completely upside down. Lots of people are killed in the initial thing, but lots of people survive. And then they have to try to work out how to get off this boat. And they kind of figure the distress will go out, rescuers will come, but they need to get to a place where they can be rescued in this massive hulk of metal. And so Gene Hackman, who is Rev- the Reverend Scott, He's a minister. I think I might have related to that. But uh, he's, um, he leads a group of people, a small group of people, a group of people who didn't stay with the majority because the majority were listening to one of the cabin crew who said, no, we should just stay put. We'll be best here. But uh, due to their conversation with a young boy who knew about boats and stuff, the thinnest bit of the hole is down by the propellers. We've got to get down there. Then we've got a chance kind of thing. And he leads this group of people through the ship. It's a a very dangerous journey and I think they start with 10 and maybe three of them die along the way. And they get to nearly the very end of the journey. It's just through another kind of porthole thing and they've got to get through and they're where they need to be. And there's this explosion and a, a pipe ruptures and there's a shower of steam that is scoldingly hot and it blocks the way to where they need to go. And uh, the Reverend Scott sees the the stopcock valve thing which he could jump out to and turn off. But it's over a huge drop to burning oil and water beneath. So it's a very dangerous thing to do. And he he jumps out and he's cursing this blooming ship that's trying to destroy these lovely people who've grown so close to. And he, in a very dramatic kind of 70s blockbuster way, slowly turns this stopcock as he rails against this ship that is killing his friends. And if you want one more life, take mine, he says. And he he shuts off the steam and drops to his death. 
and it becomes apparent that he knew he wasn't going to make it, he gave himself so the rest of the group could get through. It made a huge impact on me that someone might give themselves to save other people. Now, it's an understatement to suggest that not all the disciples were on the same page as Jesus at this point. Peter was not yet really understanding the program, and uh, that's quite fair too, because he'd been waiting his whole life for the Messiah, and his people had been waiting their whole history for the Messiah, and it was unthinkable that this whole story should end in the Messiah's rejection and death. So Peter figures, Jesus, you're just not thinking clearly. Come over here, mate. I'll sort you out. And gives him a metaphoric slap over the back of the head. Now, if you read carefully, the, the body language that is listed in this little story is great. He's over here with Peter, and he turns to the disciples and addresses Peter. Gives Peter his back and says, get behind me, Satan. So if you want a metaphoric slap, that's a pretty brutal one, I reckon. <laughs> Now, no doubt there were any number of strategies this burgeoning movement could have employed to ensure that Jesus did not fall foul of the authorities. And surely the success of their new enterprise required that they protect their, you know, inspirational leader. But Jesus had no time for any of it. Because the interests of the kingdom run so counter to the interests of this world that the kingdom quite simply does not advance by employing worldly strategies. And that's hard for us to understand. God's ways are not the world's ways supercharged. They are other ways, wholly other ways. Our only hope is to be freed from our instinctual self-interest. It's one of the things that concerns me most about this thing called prosperity doctrine or prosperity 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 theology. Um, it tends to relegate God to the role of servant of our purposes and then simply adopts an entirely worldly view of what is good. Because amassing a large pile of resources is a winning strategy in the world if your idea is about surviving. But it's an unthinkable thing, unthinkable that that would make sense in a kingdom culture. Because the prosperity in kingdom culture is about building trust and goodwill and genuine community. Things like joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and above all, love. These are the contours of prosperity in the kingdom. You cannot buy these things with money. They are the fruit of caring for one another. They are the fruit of God's spirit. And at the very end of this little passage, Jesus takes quite an unexpected turn, I think. He addresses the matter of shame. And shame is a really interesting thing. It's a response to social signals. It is a mechanism which operates both around us and within us. And that is to say, we can do things to trigger someone else's experience of shame, and we also have built-in unconscious triggers within, our, within ourselves. And often these days, shame is considered to be destructive. In reality, I believe, it's an evolved mechanism that's designed to alert us when we abrogate, abrogate the social fabric, when we do something that is dangerous to society. When someone puts, does something that puts at risk the well-being of the whole group, it is appropriate and even helpful that they should experience shame. The shameless person can do untold damage to the well-being of the group and how effectively the community holds together. You only have to observe modern day politics to understand that, I think. It is the case that as a society we have used the shame trigger in unhelpful ways. Victim shaming in its many guises is an example of this. It's a destructive use of the shame response. But the social mechanism of shame really is an alarm bell to alert us that the social fabric, the way we do things here, has been broken. Now, it's never an easy thing to break away from a dominant culture. 
Down through history, there have been ongoing breaks with established cultural norms, and some people might call these things progress. Others might see them as a progressive dissolution of society as we've known it, and it's possible for both of those things to be true at the same time. We generally see monarchy giving way to democracy as positive. That's a big social change, right? Or the dominance of male-only power eventually giving way to women's rights to vote. That's progress. And other breaks are differently lauded. Whether it's uh, corporate capitalism or corporate communism, the cultures of the world always have their victims and are always destructive. Fifty years ago, Herbert Marcuse, who I don't know, but was quoted in a thing I read this morning, <laughs> he said that corporate capitalism makes individuals complicit in their own misery. They are trapped in a system that offers them happiness in return for their own obedience and conformity at the expense of others. The happiness of the ones must coexist with the suffering of others. And this is quite a neat defi definition of world culture, I think. So Jesus wants to challenge this, and he puts the challenge to us. Basically, he says, be aware of which culture you are choosing to be at home in. Are you at home in the world? Is that your culture? Or are you at home in the kingdom? Is that your culture? I remember when I um, first saw that movie of the, the reverend turning off the thing and dropping into the thing and thinking, wow, someone... And it kind of didn't make sense to me, to be honest. I thought, why would someone give their life for others? I was too young at the time to really understand very much, I think. At that stage, for me, to die like that was a futile end. I didn't have the capacity to understand the life-giving power of a person's death, nor indeed the emptiness of the survival existence that is perpetually in fear of living life. Those things hadn't kind of become clear to me. Jesus knew enough to accept the inevitability of his path in life. He had choices, but he was go not going to accommodate himself to the dominant oppressive culture of the world. He would not participate in making victims for his own uh, well-being. Rather, he would allow his life, death and resurrection to reveal the world, to expose that system to make that which had been hidden plain for all to see. And now Jesus calls us to live in his kingdom. And it means dying to this world. And in doing so, we discover an eternal life, a whole other quality of life, not just normal life turbocharged, but another kind that shows survival is merely a form of waiting to live and we only really live when we give ourselves. So we're going to gather around this symbolic meal in a moment, around our Saviour who gave himself and he invites us to follow him and we give thanks. Amen.